So, um, hi again. Uh, my name is Elmar. Um, I'm partner and engineer at Cementis, and uh, we build a lot of enterprise applications. And today I'm going to talk about a framework which we released just like three weeks ago. It's basically a framework that um, makes the usage of NS user defaults much simpler and safer and gives a little bit of extra power onto it. Um, first of all, to start, um, I hope everybody knows what NS user defaults are, and I guess everybody has used them before. Anybody doesn't know? Okay. Um, the important thing to keep in mind is that NS user defaults are not a real database. They're just a key value storage. And you should really only use it for small data. You should really not try to put like huge objects, graphs into them. Um, so that's the thing to keep in mind when you, when you work with those, the, those kind of APIs. Um, but what's the point? Why a framework for NS user defaults? Um, around about two years ago, Apple introduced Swift, and they really did a great job in bridging all the Objective-C APIs to Swift. But the problem is the kids are still Objective-C. So if you want to work with it in Swift, it's a little bit of crusty sometimes, and it doesn't feel like a Swift API. So if you want to use it, you have to find ways to really make it uh, charming with your stuff you're writing. And to illustrate the problems that appear when you try to use Objective-C APIs in Swift, um, I'm going to show some typical examples from GitHub. Um, this is really like going into GitHub, search for NS user defaults and set object. And then it's, it's not to make fun of the implementations, but rather to, to illustrate really the the points which are complicated when you try to, to use this, these a APIs. Um, for example, this one is actually a really great way of implementing the user defaults because he's using like subscript and just an extension and his user defaults. Um, um, so basically, all you need is the, the string for the key. Um, but there's one problem. Objective-C is not as type safe as Swift. So basically, this kind of, this way of using the NS user defaults is only using any object as optional, and it tries to store everything in a computed getter, in a computed setter here, as an uh, object, and it tries to get everything as object. So in case you have anything that is basically NS coding safe, that one would fail. In case you have anything which is not any object, like for example, string, integer, or whatever, you have to cast it outside of the function. And this is just horrible. I mean, it's super error prone, and you really don't want to have that kind of API in your, in your uh, application. Um, Another solution I found was, it's, it's a little bit more complex. Um, as you can see, there's just basically one getter function, and it's type safe. It returns an array of string, which is super great to use in Swift. And he even has some kind of fallback, like here, where user cities equals nil. Um, then he returns like default cities. And the default cities are defined up here. There is also a key defined, which is used here for getting and here as well. And underneath here, he casts into string array. Yeah, it's, it's better. And it's kind of a similar way we started to do it. But the problem is, this is only the getter. This is not yet any setter, and you don't really want to copy that kind of code like for multiple um, uh, um, things you want to store in the, in, the, in the user defaults. So really cool, do the research, 
And you can do that with, with any kind of, of kit APIs. It's really interesting to see the implementations. And I mean, OK, so what's the point? What is the new idea? Are there any new ideas? Um, we had the same problems in the beginning. And we had a couple of Swift uh, projects where we used NSUSA defaults. And it was just like, oh, is it really that hard? And we have to find a better way. So um, after a couple of months, we isolated a certain pattern for them. And then um, we thought, OK, why not just uh, put it open source and just let everybody use the same thing? Because it's, it's not that complicated. And um, you, can't do much too much, uh, you can't do too many failures in that case. So that's why we have Palau. Um, and it's user defaults with wings. The basic goals of the framework are we should provide a type safe interface, which means you don't have to cast outside. It should be uh, concise, so you don't have to do a lot of stuff. It just should be simple. We also wanted to have some kinds, some things like fallbacks or certain rules for the values, and maybe even something like observation when the values have changed. And it would be pretty neat if it would be customizable so that if your style of using Swift changes, you should be able to make modifications to the framework as well. And it's very easy to do it because of you can extend like everything in Swift. And furthermore, we don't know what people want to store in the NS user defaults. As I said, it's not about object graphs or anything like that. It's more about like maybe a struct. So how do you store a struct into NS user defaults? How do you store a tuple? Basically not possible with the API Apple brought. So I'm going to show some typical examples how you use Palau defaults. That's it. <laughs> um, there is, like here, the type Palau defaults. You have static access to an entry, which is called username. And if you want to set the value, you just take the value property and set the value. If you want to get the value, you just read it out. That's it. Type save. And if you have a look at the implementation, it's quite simple. All you need to do is you have to import the framework. You only write extensions to the defaults. You define the property you want to use, like for example here username. And you always return a type, not just the value itself. You, uh, you return the type of Palau defaults entry. And this one is generic, so you tell the system it's of type string. And everything will just roll back and treat it as a string. So the property itself has a getter and a setter. The setter is empty. This is just because the compiler wants to know that he's able to set the value. But basically, you're only working on the thing that is returned by calling value username. So no need to store a static key for making sure that you always use the same key. It's just defined once, and the type is defined once. That's it. It's that simple. But there's more to it. What if you want to provide a fallback? So you want to read out of the NS user defaults, but you have not set any value before. So for example here, if you call Palau default cities value, you get an array of Munich and London. And then you're going to change it to Bielefeld, if you want to. Um, it's that simple. So how do we implement it? It's the same pattern. All we have is oops, the same Palau defaults entry which is typed to array string. We have the value cities with a key. And then we have, like in a builder pattern, a function which is called where nil. And then with the use label, we provide type safe, the thing you want to return in case there is no value set. That's it. The next one. Ah, yeah, by the, by the way, if you don't want to use the name Palau defaults, feel free just to change it and use a type alias, and you can do whatever you want to do. So in this case, we're using defaults instead of Palau defaults. And 
here we have um, a rule like there's a certain value you want to want to have settings and you want to change a value and you want to make sure that this value is never less than 10 for example so in the first thing here i'm getting the value it's 10 then i'm setting the value to 8 and when i'm reading it back it's 10 again so it hasn't changed how is it implemented just like the same way it's always the builder pattern so what we do is we have the same static property, it's called alert time seconds. It returns the Palau defaults entry of type integer. There is the computed getter, which takes the value alert time seconds. When nil, it uses 10. And there is an ensure method, which says when less than 10. And basically, you can build up the rules however you want to. It's just a function which takes an int and an optional int and returns bool. So you, you, you can write them up just from, the, from, from seeing the signature. And then in that case, we want to use 10 again. So that's a super easy way just to, to build up really complex stuff and you can add as many ensure methods as you want to. Um, like say, when I have certain date rules or whatever you want to do. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's super flexible and you can do whatever you want to. Another good thing is, for example, you have a defaults value which you change, and you want to be like you want to subscribe to any change of it. Um, and there is this uh, this nice uh, method called did set where you get the old value and the new value when you have a property. We can do the same here. We have just again the value login date, and then we provide a function which is called did set, and there we just provide another function which has, has access to the old value and access to the new value. That's it. Basically, that's all on top of it uh, is visible. Um, but the cool thing is, it's extremely customizable. So if you have like custom types and you want to store them, or for example, in this case, you want to store values based on a year, for example. Um, it doesn't make sense to add, like, every year a new version of your application and adding a new property for the new defaults value which you want to use. So what we have here is, like, a, a basic struct, which is called year settings, and you initialize it with a year, like 2016, and then I can just change a value to 100. And if I provide a different year, like 2017, it will write into a different NS user defaults property. It's just completely separated. How does it work? And this is just a showcase to show, on one hand, how cool Swift is, because you can mess with the libraries however you, whatever you want to do, and how flexible the whole framework is, because um, basically, the Palau defaults is just a wrapper for your properties. So we, we haven't included any kind of initializer for the thing. But for certain features, you need to have a concrete instance. Like, for example, if you want to use subscript. So what we do is, and you can easily do the same, we just create an instance of Palau defaults. We retroactively add an initializer, with this, which does nothing. It just creates Palau defaults. And then we can use the subscript method and say, for example, value in year, use the integer, and return the Palau defaults entry. And basically, the subscript does nothing else than changing the key based on what you provide to the subscript. So if you use the struct down here, you have just the year, and you have the value, and it uses the Palau defaults instance top here, and uses the subscript method. So with that way, it's always safe that the value you set to the struct is immediately stored into the NS user defaults. Every time you read it, it's the real truth which is stored inside the user defaults. So basically, this is kind of some things you can do with, with Palau. Um, the cool thing is it just makes you relax because it's, it's not much to read, it's not much to write, and it's, you can be pretty sure that it works most of the time. There are some glitches, but I only will talk about them if you ask me, um, which is mainly due to, to some things which are still missing in Swift. But um, the main thing is that 
It works for most of the standard types out of the box. It supports NS coding. So whenever you try to say Palau defaults entry of type uh, UI color, whatever, it just stores it. Um, you can also add custom types, like for example, if you have instruct, you just have to um, implement one protocol, add two methods, and that's it, and you can store your struct. And the cool thing is, you don't have to cast it. You just use the defaults entry with a struct type, and then get the struct back, and if you set the struct, then it's stored. Um, yeah, then of course we have those uh, per property based chainable rules. Um, we have the did set observation, and we have a pretty good test coverage of 100%. Um, there's, I think the test is so intense that we might even have found a bug in the uh, way Apple did the Xcode test handling with NS user defaults. So we're still in discussion with one of the guys from Apple because it might be that there is a problem. Um, the thing is on GitHub, you can check it out. Um, we launched three weeks ago. We have around about 330 stars right now. And um, you will find more examples in the readme, and you can have a look at the test suite, and it's just makes life more easier. So yeah, that's it. So if, if you want to know more about it, you can either talk to me at Twitter, or just go my little blog, or just uh, ask me here, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> 16 minutes. <laughs> so, um, any questions? Yeah? How did you come up with the name? Uh, the thing is, um, it took like two minutes. Um, basically, we were looking for something which is, uh, you, don't, you don't have any other idea in your head. Um, it should not start with Swifty, because everything is called Swifty nowadays. And the thing is that there is a certain kind of uh, Swiftlet which is on Palau, which is called the Palau Swiftlet. And as we call our frameworks in the company named to something like, it's always water related, so we thought that Palau might be a good idea. Yeah. Any other questions on the implementation? Okay, perfect. So that's it. Thank you.